today we're going to cover chapter six, which is going to look at reproduction at the cellular level. So here are some examples of cells that are going through reproduction. Over on the left you have a sea urchin. It begins life as a single cell and then it will divide to form two cells. So these can be seen on these scanning electron microscope images. So after four rounds of division you end up with 16 cells. So it goes from one cell to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to sixteen. After many cell division rounds, the individual is going to develop into a complex multicellular organ that you would see as the sea urchin on the right. This is going to be similar to what happens to our cells. And this is called mitosis. So inside your cell, you've got your genome, which is the cell's genetic material. Our cells fall into two categories regarding cell division. Your somatic cells are going to be your non-reproductive cells. In humans, these are everything except the sperm and the egg. They're diploid, which means they've got two matched sets of chromosomes. Your gametes are the sex cells. These are the sperm and the egg. They're haploid. They're only going to have one set of chromosomes. It's important that they only have one set of chromosomes because they will combine with somebody else's gamete to form a diploid cell. And so it's important to have normal development with only having half the genetic information come from each parent. In a human, if you bring extra, a full extra set of chromosomes, it will not be viable. Your homologous chromosomes are going to be the matched pairs of chromosomes in the diploid organism. They're going to have the same length and the same genes. The genes are the functional units of the chromosome. They're going to be the instructions that code for making a specific protein. The locus is just the location of the gene on the chromosome. So each copy of homologous chromosomes originates from a different parent. This picture here is called a karyotype, and this is from a human. There are 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes that are going to be viewed. They get put in order from the longest to the shortest. The 23rd pair is going to represent the sex chromosomes that will determine the sex of the individual. So you can see they each have similar length, shape, and staining patterns in each homologous pair. So in the cell cycle, we have a series of events that involve cell growth and then division to produce two new daughter cells. The majority of a cell's life is spent in inner phase, which is going to be its normal day-to-day -day living phase. The cell is going to grow, DNA is replicated, but it's also going to be doing its normal cellular activities. <clears throat> the mitotic phase, or mitosis, is the dividing phase. Here the contents are going to be separated and they get divided into two cells. Mitosis literally means division of the cytoplasm, or division of the nucleus. So as the cell moves through these series of phases, this diagram here allows you to see the mitotic phase is just a small portion and that inner phase is the majority of the cell's life cycle. In the mitotic phase, we divided it into mitosis, which is your division of the nucleus, and cytokinesis, which is the division of the cytoplasm. And then there are three parts to inner phase. We have G1, S phase, and G2. During G1, there's a lot of cell growth. During S phase is when there's DNA synthesis. It's getting ready for its big day when it is going to get to divide. And then in G2, you have more growth. So that G1 phase is your first gap. Here the cell is biochemically active. It's starting to accumulate the building blocks. During S phase, S is for the synthesis phase, the DNA replication is going to occur to form sister chromatids. These are two identical copies of each chromosome and is duplicating the chromosome. The mitotic spindle is going to help to orchestrate the movement of the chromosomes during mitosis. In animal cells, we have the centrioles that are going to help organize cell division. Centrioles are not present in plant cells. They're only in animal cells. During G2 phase, or your second gap, you're going to replenish the energy stores and synthesize proteins for chromosome manipulation. So 
animal cell mitosis gets divided into five stages. You may see some sources that will only divide this into four stages. Basically, these first two almost get combined. Either way is correct. It just depends on what you're using as your guide source on how it's taught. Your particular textbook teaches five phases, so that's what we're going to go with here. So you've got prophase, this first phase. Here the chromosomes condense and become visible. Your spindle fibers are going to start to emerge from the centrosome, so we're going to start to see the very beginning of forming a mitotic spindle. Your nuclear envelope is going to break down and the nucleolus will disappear. In prometaphase, the chromosomes continue to condense and they begin to look a lot more like chromosomes. Your kinetal cores appear at the centromeres. This is going to be where you're going to have the chromosomes attach. The mitotic spindle microtubules attach to the kinetal cores. The centrosome moves towards the opposite poles. So you can see that here with the two little dots on the ends of the picture. In metaphase, the mitotic spindle is fully developed and the centrosomes are at opposite poles of the cells. The chromosomes are going to line up in the center along what's called the metaphase plate. Each of the sister chromatids is attached to a spindle fiber that originates from opposite poles. So during anaphase, you have the cohesin proteins that are holding the sister chromatids start to break down. The sister chromatids are going to be pulled apart in opposite directions towards the opposite poles, and the non kinetal core spindle fibers are going to lengthen and elongate the cell. So you can see it's beginning to stretch out. In telophase, the chromosomes arrive at the opposite poles and begin to decondense. You're going to start to form a new nuclear envelope to surround the genetic material of each of the sets of chromosomes. The mitotic spindle will break down. With cytokinesis, if it's an animal cell, you'll see a cleavage furrow that's going to start to form in on the sides where the cell starts to pinch apart. In plant cells, because they've got the rigid cell walls, instead you'll have a cell plate that will segregate the two daughter cells. Exactly how far into the cycle cytokinesis occurs will depend on what type of cell it is. So cytokinesis, or a division of the cytoplasm, begins following the onset of anaphase in animal cells. That cleavage furrow is created by an actin ring that pulls the equator inward. It's similar to having like a drawstring at the waist of the pants, and as you tighten the drawstring, it's going to start to pinch inward or narrow around the waist of the pants. The cell plate is going to be a collection and fusion of Golgi vesicles that collect on the metaphase plate of the plant cell. This will form a new wall in the plant cell. So this is going to diagram here your cleavage furrow. Here's where you're going to have that contractile ring and it pinches into two cells. Here with the plant cell you're going to form the cell plate and you'll end up with two cells. So you just can't pinch off a cell wall, it's too rigid. The GO phase is an inactive stage. These are going to be cells that are not actively dividing. Some cells will enter this temporarily, others rarely divide. That would be things like our cardiac, muscles, cardiac muscle cells and our nerve cells that are going to rarely divide. So if you get injuries to those types of cells, your likelihood of having healing or repair occur is much less likely than other places, such as when you cut your skin. Those cells are always dividing so that your skin can heal quite easily. A cut nerve is not necessarily going to heal. So what will happen is after cells come into G1, they will have a checkpoint that if they don't go through that checkpoint and trigger it to finish going through the dividing cycle, that's when they're going to make the detour into the GO phase. So that G1 checkpoint is going to determine if the conditions are favorable for division. 
If they are, it will commit irreversibly to going all the way through division. If not, that's when it will go into the GO phase. Your G2 checkpoint, this is going to make sure the cell size is adequate, that it's got enough protein reserves, the chromosomes are ready for mitosis, that everything is ready to go into the dividing phase. In mitosis, you've got the M checkpoint, which is at the end of, end of metaphase. This is going to ensure your sister chromatids are aligned along the metaphase plate. This is important because if they're not aligned properly, you can end up with having an irregular number of chromosomes in the daughter cells. When they're aligned, this will ensure that each of the daughter cells is going to get an equal number of chromosomes. So this just gives you a visual of where these various checkpoints occur. G1, the restriction point is here towards the end of G1 phase. Your G2 is towards the end of G2 phase. And then right in the middle of mitosis you have that M checkpoint so that it would be at the end of metaphase. So when the cell cycle is not working properly, one of the things that it can lead to is cancer. Proto-oncogenes are positive cell cycle regulators. These are normal genes that can become mutated and become oncogenes. Oncogenes are cell, cells genes that are known to become cancerous. So tumor suppressor genes, these are going to code for negative regulator proteins. These prevent cells from undergoing uncontrolled cell division. There are several of these genes that we have studied. One example is the p53 gene. And this one has mutated in more than half of human tumors. There are multiple genes that can go wrong in tumors. So for cancers to say that there is one cause of cancer, there's not. There's multiple things that will go wrong to lead to a cancer, multiple different things that can be wrong in several different cancers. So the idea that there is one cure for a cancer is highly unlikely as well because there's so many different things causing it. But what they all fall into the category of is the cell is going to grow uncontrollably and no longer follow the rules. <clears throat> so this just shows here the role of a normal P53. When DNA damage occurs, the cell cycle has some abnormalities. So with P53, it can cause cell cycle arrest and apoptosis, which is pre-programmed cell death. So in a good normal cell, what's going to happen is the P53 is going to cause the cell to destroy itself rather than let it go on to do uncontrolled cell division. The other option is to repair the DNA and the cell cycle can restart. If the P53 gene is mutated and the cell cycle becomes abnormal, the cell cycle is just going to continue and you can have the uncontrolled growth that becomes cancerous. Prokaryotic cells, they are not going to do mitosis because mitosis is division of the nucleus. Prokaryotic cells don't have a nucleus. Instead, what they're going to do is binary fission. It's got an origin of replication, which is the starting point of replication. It's close to the binding site of the chromosome to the plasma membrane. So the chromosome at the origin of replication will copy itself and it does it bidirectionally. The chromosome is circular in a prokaryotic cell, so it will go around the circle in the two opposite directions until the replication meets on the other side. So as a new double strand forms, the origin moves away from the cell wall and the attachments towards the opposite ends. The cell is going to elongate and transport the chromosomes. A septum will be formed between the nucleoid regions from the periphery towards the center, and it creates a division of two new cells. So this is just showing the steps here of binary fission. So up in this top picture, you can see where you've got your tiny origin of replication. It's going to start to move around as you're doubling and copying the chromosome. They'll be moving to the opposite side. You're going to form the septum, and you end up with two new cells.